we started off, um, I think, very, uh, well, young for one, but also maybe a little bit naive and very idealistic. I think part of, I sometimes describe myself as part of the web uh, 1.0 generation when mm -hmm. we thought that technology was, there was only going to be good things coming out of the internet. We were all going to be connected and informed and, you know, things turned out to be more complex than I think we anticipated, but I think you need that idealism at the beginning. Um, and, and I think that spirit of, of people who experience this kind of that you, you can make connections with people all over the world using technology, working together and learning together. Um, I think that's still at the core of a lot of my work. Yeah, I started peer-to-peer -peer university, you know, inspired by peer-to-peer -peer networking. So, um, you know, the, the basic uh, principles of the internet. And um, I think I see some of the same values also in, in 42. So it's, um, it's great to talk to you today. Uh, please do come back and share a little bit about the peer-to-peer the -peer university, because that was quite a journey uh, from, you know, the idealistic, this is what it could be, and then really um, iterating and finding what actually works and what uh, brings people together and um, adds learning. Also on that idealism the point, I cannot resist to say, I don't think it was naive, Philip. I think it was idealistic, and I think uh, the potential that we saw, the opportunity was there, and to a significant degree still is there. It's only that, you know, the um, part that we didn't expect and that fair enough, maybe, you know, we could have seen is that there is a, a counterbalance to the, the positive um, elements. But it seems to me that now the panel has swung all the way to the other direction. And, uh, you know, you only see the, the um, <clears throat> horrible things that can go wrong. Um, and that's also not helpful. I think uh, it also needs, um, folks like us who still see the potential and want to bring it about. And uh, thanks for seeing 42 as part of that um, endeavor. So, so I think we will see much more innovation and diversity and it's a little bit of a cliche, but I think this idea of lifelong learning is, it's not something that's gonna happen in the future, it's already happening. Like everyone who is in a career is continuously learning new things like you cannot it's just not possible anymore to go to university for four or five years or six years and then you've learned everything you ever needed to learn to be good at this job that you you want to do and the rest you can just learn on the job um, I think that's uh, that's largely not true anymore already and that's just going to become less true in the future as people have to change careers and change jobs and also the jobs are changing so rapidly that um, they don't look anything um, like they did when you started university, when you finish it these days. And so, um, of, of course, you have to continue to learn. I think uh, what it does, it, is, it demands that type of um, self-understanding, right, of a, a certain reflection in, uh, about your life and what you want. And I mean, in the end, you won't be surprised to hear that uh, from me as a philosopher. It is the project of enlightenment, right, to have... Uh, the, the free will to understand that you can decide things like that. Well, I'm super happy that um, uh, we get together today. Um, my name is Max Senges. I'm the CEO and Headmaster of 42 Wolfsburg. That's uh, my new role since uh, the beginning of September. So um, it's quite a ride and I'm um, looking forward to the next months and, and years in that job. Today, we um, try out a new format, 42X. It's a um, series of deep dives where um, we found what um, we, in our humble opinion, think are thought leaders and people who really push the core themes of 42 Wolfsburg. So next generation education, next generation software engineering, and next generation mobility slash automotive. And uh, today I'm super happy that Philip agreed to have a um, conversation with me. Philip is the director for digital learning and uh, collaboration at the MIT Media Lab. That's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, we met, oh gosh, Philip, we're getting old. Um, I guess it's almost 12 years ago, around 2008, um, when we were both excited about um, 
thinking how to improve copyright and how to bring that into the digital era in the context of a Creative Commons conference in um, Japan, in Sapporo, and we thought about how to open up education and open educational resources and uh, have stayed in touch ever since. And you had quite a ride. Um, do you want to introduce yourself in a little bit about uh, what you did and what you care about? Sure, yeah, and also thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. As you know, I'm um, quite intrigued and uh, a little bit of, of a fan maybe of the 42 model. Um, I've had the chance to talk to some of your other um, satellites in, uh, in France and in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, I was excited to hear that you took on this new role and you're starting up 42 Wolfsburg um, because it fits in um, into the kind of broader area of things that I've, I've been interested in. Um, you know, as you say, uh, we started off, um, I think very, uh, well, young for one, but also maybe a little bit naive and very idealistic. I think part of, I sometimes describe myself as part of the web uh, 1.0 generation when mm. we thought that technology was there was only going to be good things coming out of the internet. We were all going to be connected and informed and um, giving everybody was... a voice. Exactly. And, you know, things turned out to be more complex than I think we anticipated, but I think you need that idealism at the beginning. Um, and, and I think that spirit of, of people who experience this kind of that you, you can make connections with people all over the world using technology, working together and learning together. Um, I think that's still at the core of a lot of my work. Yeah, I started peer-to-peer -peer university, you know, inspired by peer-to-peer -peer networking. So, um, you know, the, the basic uh, principles of the internet. And um, I think I see some of the same values also in, in 42. So it's, um, it's great to talk to you today. Awesome. And um, uh, please do come back and share a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer university, because that was quite a journey uh, from, you know, the idealistic, this is what it could be, and then really um, iterating and finding what actually works and what uh, brings people together and um, adds learning. Also on that idealism the point, I cannot resist to say, I don't think it was naive, Philip. I think it was idealistic, and I think uh, the potential that we saw, the opportunity was there, and to a significant degree still is there. It's only that, you know, the um, part that we didn't expect and that fair enough, maybe, you know, we could have seen is that there is a, a counterbalance to the, the positive um, elements. But it seems to me that now the panel has swung all the way to the other direction. And, uh, you know, you only see the, the um, <clears throat> horrible things that can go wrong. Um, and that's also not helpful. I think uh, it also needs, um, folks like us who still see the potential and want to bring it about. And uh, thanks for seeing 42 as part of that um, endeavor. So um, we prepared a couple of questions and um, I always want to uh, find it super interesting to understand what were the educational experiences that um, make a difference in people's lives. And so I'd love to, for you to elaborate a little bit when um, you grow up, or maybe it was um, just um, much more recently, um, when did you have a really impactful and pivotal um, educational experience? Yeah, and I actually wanna share two. When you first um, mentioned this question to me, my immediate, uh, I immediately went to kind of that time actually that I just talked about, which is when I first discovered the internet, and I got a, um, a, a, an account on a Unix workstation and an email address. And I um, joined some open source software communities and discussion groups. And you know, at, at the time, the first thing that most people wanted to do was build their own personal website. And so you had to learn what HTML was and where do you put these files and how does an HTTP server work? And, the reality was there wasn't a ton of documentation out there yet. Like there weren't any books really. And so you ended up looking, you know, you clicked view source on the websites that you looked at. And, and that was one of the amazing thing that actually everything was, was there. Like, you know, people just, you, you were able to download the entire 
um, kind of content of another website and then just make changes to it and upload it and you had your own website. That of course is not possible in the same way anymore. Um, but so I think that that was one, just kind of the, the fact that, you know, view source I think is just such a great metaphor um, for, mm -hmm. Um, for building learning communities. And then the other one is just the people that I met during that time. Some of those people I've never met in person to this date. And some of them I'm not in touch with anymore, but others I'm still in touch with. And um, that sense of sharing and support, and you could ask questions and people would really help each other out. That, that was really just a, an incredible experience. But the other one that, that I, um, I wanna mention is in high school, I, I worked on a project during project week and we made a, uh, a movie, we made a, a film. It was me and, and an, a friend of mine. And um, I remember working harder than I had ever worked before in, in high school. Stayed up all night long to try to edit this film. Um, we, we did all kinds of crazy shots. We had to learn all kinds of things about how the camera worked. This was like VHS um, tapes. And then you had to put them into these um, decks to edit it and copy it back and forth and as it, get the music on it, really complicated stuff. And we had to figure everything out ourselves, but we basically worked, like didn't sleep for the entire week. And the thing that really stay, stayed with me is that when people are interested in something, they will work around the clock, they'll figure it out, they'll, they'll ask for help where they can get it. And then at the end, you have this incredible sense of accomplishment, even though in retrospect, it was probably a terrible film. But I, I still remember how we made this film and then we showed it to our friends and I just felt so proud of it. And, and so that, that idea of working on projects that are meaningful to you with your friends, you know, and actually the only teacher involved was um, an art teacher who knew nothing about video production, but who was very supportive. You know, he, he kind of encouraged us and, and and said, this is great and keep going and, you know, don't give up. And so you don't always need the experts, but that, that sense of, of um, just confidence, creative confidence, I think is, is a good term um, that you get from an experience like this, where you, you work through something that was not easy. You, you come out the other end, you have something that you can show to other people. It's, it's just such a great experience. And I wish more of school was like that. Um, it was just this one project week where we had this incredible experience and then it was back to, you know, somewhat boring. I was not a super happy um, uh, student in, in school. So I enjoyed that more than the typical classes. Yeah, uh, I very much relate to that. I mean, it's um, the whole project-based learning and the passion and the play and the peers that uh, Mitch Resnick also, um, you know, basis his lifelong kindergarten group and that approach on and yeah I mean that's what gets you excited I guess um, the the question that um, is is uh, related and very difficult is okay so that works for the cool stuff but it does that also work for math and um, you know uh, literature um, if you don't like poems, right? Is, is that um, okay? Is it, does that mean that you just never learn about poems or uh, do you have to? Or if you don't like math, uh, you know, how do you uh, ensure that there is a base or don't we need that base? So I, I do admit that I probably have a bias. Um, I think humans are um, fundamentally born to learn. We are we are born with an incredible sense of curiosity about the world. And um, we have, we are also extremely good at it. Like, you know, we are, we're very good at learning both just to make sense of the environment around us, but also social learning, which is one of the things that I think distinguishes humans from most other species, that we are so good at social learning. We're learning with other people, from other people, copying. Um, so, my, my bias is that everything is interesting. Um, and if you create the right environment, humans will do interesting things with it. So of course, if you have to read a thousand poems and learn to recite them, maybe you lose the interest in poetry, but you know, maybe for, for someone who uh, likes computers, they can write a software program that generates poetry. And then they become interested in like, what is poetry and how do you write software that generates it? And how is this, this poem different from this, right? So there's different paths into 
these these um, subjects. And actually, you mentioned Mitch Resnick, so maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of sentences about him. He he runs a research group at the Media Lab called Lifelong Kindergarten. And the, this framework that you mentioned is called creative learning. It has four components, projects, peers, passion, and play. And we try to use this framework for our academic program at the Media Lab. So, um, you know, we don't, um, it's not just for making movies or fun stuff. It's also for all the other subjects at the, at the Media Lab. And we think that the framework can be applied to, to other experiences. And the person that actually this work um, kind of traces back to is Seymour Papert, who was a founding faculty member at the Media Lab. He was a, he was a South African mathematician and uh, who studied child psychology with Piaget and then built some of the first systems where children would be um, users and programmers of computers. They would be creating things with computers. And he thought of computers as thinking machines. Um, and uh, he was very interested in uh, thinking about thinking is one of those perfect Simo Papert quotes. Um, he was interested in using different approaches, different tools to think about thinking and to, to create things. And he, he had this gr great testimony in front of the uh, US Congress that, that is, you can download the video, it's on C-SPAN or on YouTube somewhere. And you can just see the faces of the congressmen and it, they, they, he blows their minds and they, they don't understand what he's talking about at all, unfortunately. But he makes this great comparison that he says, um, we expect, uh, you know, we, we say that some kids are good at math and others are not good at math. But when you go to France and you see the small children there and they're growing up, they all learn to speak French somehow, right? And we, we don't really say, uh, oh, this kid has a head for French or this kid doesn't have a head for French. No, if, if you're in the right environment, you will learn to speak French. And, and so his idea was, how do we create an environment where kids can learn to speak math? That is, is so natural, it makes so much sense that it's, it, it, there's no question that like you're good at math or you have a head for math and you don't. No, 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 we need to create a world in which math is a language that everyone can, can learn to speak. And that really stayed with me. And I think he was onto something. Of course, it's, it's a much different story. How do you take these beautiful ideas and concepts and translate them into education experiences, right? There, there's a lot that gets lost in that translation and it's, it's not trivial, but I think that's the right aspiration. Max, I think you're muted. Awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. That was awesome. And what a, uh, I learned a lot. I didn't know that French uh, example, and it's, it's very compelling. Now, uh, another question that I think uh, every interviewer should ask is, what is the question that I should be asking? If we are thinking about in the next generation education, next generation software, and so on, what, what do you think is uh, the key question we should ask ourselves right now? That's a very good question. I, I did not expect this question, Max. So I, let me think about this for one for a few seconds. Um, yes. I think may, maybe one question I wish more people would would ask uh, when they start, um, especially I think a lot of people who come into the learning and education space with a technology background. I see a lot of, I work at MIT, as you mentioned, I see a lot of engineers come into education with new ideas for tools and technologies that are going to make learning, learning better. And, and I think one of the questions that I wish more of them would ask are um, things like, what do they mean by learning? And it's actually, I mean, it's kind of such an obvious question, but um, it, it's surprising that when you think about edtech, for example, a lot of what a lot of the tools that we see, I would categorize more as um, things that fit into a, 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 a category of training, um, where it's a very clearly defined set of facts or or skills that someone has to learn, and we are going to make that experience more efficient and faster. That's a good, that, I think that's an engineering approach to a problem, right? We have to make it faster right. and better, more, more accurate. 
but for me, learning, the amazing thing in learning is actually the opposite. It's like, and it's things like um, serendipity, right? Like it's discovering the things that you didn't know existed. It's not the most efficient path through some kind of a predefined uh, knowledge landscape that someone else has, has, has created. It's, um, you know, stumbling through the world and bumping into people and ideas and then something grabs you and, and you, 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 you want to go in that direction. And so when I, so I think the question is, what do you mean by learning? That, that should be the first question that people should, should try to answer. And then depending on the answer, the, the solutions that they develop will, will look very different, but um, they, will, they should also be assessed in very different ways. Because like, I feel like one of the big problems right now is when we talk about learning, we often, um, uh, we only measure a very small part of what I think happens during learning. And then we evaluate and support certain tools or, or institutions because they, they produce outcomes that are easily measurable, like right, standardized tests. Sure, you can create a school like Success Academy in, in New York that is ex extre extremely good at preparing kids for standardized tests. But if you then ask questions like, is it also good at creating creative confidence or having people follow, kind of, you know, discover, uh, fall in love with something that they then learn about and having that experience of having an, an interesting idea that I think is such a deeply human experience that if you've had it, you just want to have more of it, right? Like you want to, you, you get addicted to having interesting ideas. And um, I don't think that some of the schools that are very good at creating high test scores are also good at helping students have those experiences. So what we measure is very important. And I think we're, we're largely measuring the wrong things in education, unfortunately. Yeah, and some things are possibly very, you know, not only very difficult to measure, but so unique that um, <clears throat> it's close to impossible. I was listening to um, Schiller uh, and his uh, thoughts on uh, the education of aesthetics. And, uh, you know, he talks about the sublime in the character that needs to be, um, uh, you know, fostered and, uh, and educated, that that's uh, the ultimate goal. And when I was in France and was on summer holidays, I, uh, I actually made um, a point out of adding to our community values for 42, savoir vivre, to know how to live, right? I think those are skills that go uh, very in a very different direction and are in a different part of our brains than the vocational training, than the skills that you sell, right? The practice that you make a career out of. Uh, they're important nevertheless, and uh, you know, they're probably also important in your professional uh, life, but it, it's a completely different ball game, I feel in, in many ways. So um, good, good point. You know, what are we learning and what do we mean when we say we're um, engaging in education and learning? Great question, thanks. Now, um, to go to a little bit more um, uh, hands-on, but still, you know, looking uh, for your vision. When you think about the future of education, how do you think it will be different in 20 years? Or if you dare to go even further than that and think about, you know, something that takes longer to emerge, possibly even a hundred years. Yeah, it's, um, so I think my opinion has changed quite a bit in, in this area because when I started peer-to-peer -peer university, and um, maybe this is a good time to say a little bit more about that. The, the idea was really that small groups of people could come together on the internet. They could be in different countries, anywhere in the world, different ages, different, different backgrounds. Um, they could come together if they're interested in, a, in, in the same thing and they could create a learning environment that would be an alternative to formal higher education. So the dream was you don't have to go to university anymore, you can go to peer-to-peer -peer university. And actually, not only would you go to peer-to-peer -peer university, you would be creating peer-to-peer -peer university by attending it, right? Like you would be making the learning with other people. Um, and I thought that um, to a large extent, people would find that exciting. And actually that's true, people do find it exciting, but I don't think it has replaced higher education in any significant way. Like higher education has been growing 
at a, at a very rapid rate, institutional higher education, very rapid rate uh, in the last 15 years. Um, and uh, peer to peer university has also done very well, um, but it's been a complement. Like it's, it's an additional option that I think people are taking advantage of, which is great. Um, but the, the, my prediction 15 years ago, 12 years ago would have been that there's um, higher education is in, in crisis and that more formal higher education is going to be replaced by other approaches. And so on one hand, I think now I think the world looks very different. So I'm both more optimistic and also more pessimistic about the future of higher education. I think the elite universities, so I've had the, um, the privilege really to work at MIT for the last uh, six years. And um, I think the MITs of the world are gonna be fine for the foreseeable future. I mean, MIT is more than 150 years old, um, you know, in, in Germany, the, I mean, Humboldt University is like the, the, the quintessential idea of the universities. There's, there are some institutions that are hundreds of years old. They are going to continue to exist, hopefully for hundreds of years more, with relatively little changes. Um, on the other hand, I think in the US at least, there's a whole middle class of higher education that is really going to struggle because the what, what they promise to the people who go there is you pay us a lot of money, you get a degree, and then you will have a good life. You'll have a high paying job and you'll be, you'll be happy also, but usually it's the high paying job that then is supposed to make you happy. Um, and that value proposition isn't true anymore. Right? People coming, are coming out of these universities and there are, just aren't enough of these high paying jobs or they're only in very specific careers. And, um, largely the people who get those jobs come out of a small group of elite universities and the others are um, it's questionable that kind of what the value of higher education really is um, so so i think we will see much more innovation and diversity and it's a little bit of a cliche but i think this idea of lifelong learning is it's not something that's going to happen in the future it's already happening like everyone who is in a career is continuously learning new things like you cannot it's just not possible anymore to go to university for four or five years or six years and then you've learned everything you ever needed to learn to be good at this job that you you want to do and the rest you can just learn on the job um, i think that's uh that's largely not true anymore already and that's just going to become less true in the future as people have to change careers and change jobs and also the jobs are changing so rapidly that um, they don't look anything um, like they did when you started university, when you finish it these days. And so, um, of, of course, you have to continue to learn. Um, so, sorry, it's I think extra... I, feel like I, I, I rambled a little. Yeah, interrupt me. Push me in the yeah. same direction here. Yeah. Uh, no, I wanted to comment that that is uh, the system that is changing in terms of demands, but also I don't know about you, but I couldn't imagine, you know, having started a job and then doing it for 20, 30 years. I think um, you know sometimes uh, it, it seems that it's too volatile if we're talking you know one, two, three, even three years seems a bit short to me, but you know five, seven, eight years that those are um, periods of time to do something, and then of course, a the job and the uh, the learning is already changing and moving while you do it, and then um, you start a new chapter it, it, seems to become the new normal and that is something that is uh, not uh, uh, necessary not bad right it, it's portrayed as a transformation with a um, at least an ambivalent uh, character but i think uh, what it does it is it demands that type of um, self understanding right of a, a certain reflection in uh, about your life and what you want and i mean in the end you won't be surprised to hear that uh, from me as a philosopher it is the project of enlightenment right to have uh, the the free will to understand that you can decide things like that and so um you know for me the the uh, 42 is a great example um, in an area that is uh, extremely well suited for the model because it has on the one hand the programming that is very um, natural science rational you know you can use automated um, 
uh, uh, tools, for example, to, to correct and to see if uh, a program does what it's supposed to do, right? So it's, it's good for scaling in a number of ways. Um, and the skill is, is in extremely high demand. And so um, the outcome is also uh, uh, something that the learners will benefit from. But I think the meta skills, the how do you work together with um, others in a group and how to distribute work, how to um, <clears throat> you know, learn something new uh, by literally, you, know, you, you tell um, the student, go program um, a computer game with XYZ um, characteristics and they have never done it before. I think that's a very, good way of um, preparing the students for all kinds of uh, challenges in life. So as you mentioned before, you, you had been in touch. What do you think with, with uh, you had been in touch with others from the 42 network? What do you think are the, um, you know, opportunities and risks or things that you would recommend us to pay special attention to um, as we are developing the approach and the network? Um, the thing, so I've only, I've visited one 42 in person and I've talked to some of the people from the others. Um, and the thing that struck me when I visited was that sense of community that is very palpable when you walk into the room. And um, also I, in this case, I was very happy to find a very di diverse looking at least. I mean, I didn't get to know all the people, but a very diverse looking group of people who were engaging in, you know, pretty technical work, like pursuing technical tasks and, and interested in technical careers. And, you know, specifically, there was a large number of women and the women were leaders in the room, clearly. Like, you know, there's a, um, there was not your typical white male engineer who's explaining things to some other people. Um, it was um, actually the opposite. It was the, the, the woman was explaining things to the white male engineer, which was great to see. And, you know, it's, um, it, hope, I mean, the world is changing, fortunately, so, so we shouldn't be surprised by this anymore. But that sense of community, that sense of culture, that diversity is, is valued, and um, that everyone who is part of the, the effort is really, um, is a legitimate participant in building the, the culture of the school, um, that really struck me. And also, the, there was a very, um, uh, it felt very unhierarchical, like, you know, even the, like it was, sometimes it wasn't easy to see who actually works at 42 and who is a student at 42. Mm -hmm. And I, that's always, I think that's always a great sign when you walk into organizations and it's not immediately visible who is at what level of hierarchy. Um, and I'm actually, I'm not against hierarchy. I think hierarchy is important, especially um, uh, invisible hierarchy, I think, is a, is, is a real problem for uh, minorities. But, um, but having a sense of shared culture, uh, I thought, was something. The, the other thing that, that really strikes me in the pedagogy is that it, it reminds me a little bit of MIT. And like, people say that you can't, um, you can't um, finish MIT on your own. Uh, that's kind of a, like, especially the undergraduate uh, degree is, is really incredibly hard. And, um, you know, there are, of course, some geniuses that are able to do this on their own, but m mostly what you need is a group of other people to work with and to rely on to help you when you get stuck and then you help them when they get stuck. And I got the sense from the way that I've heard people talk about the pedagogy and what I saw um, that it really, the whole, the whole framework is built around this idea that um, if you want to achieve things, you know, you ultimately need a team. And so learning to work in a team is, is not something, you don't take a class in teamwork, um, you know, but the rest of the curriculum is, is done on your own. It's just that you, can, you would do everything as a team just naturally. And so then you'll, you'll develop those skills just by, by using that muscle more and more. Um, so I, th I think those are, those are some of the things that stand out to me. I mean, I, one, qu one big question I have for you and for 42 is, um, really around equity, because it's something that um, that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, initially in my career, I thought um, if it's free of charge and we let everyone participate, then it it uh, that is that's what we should be doing. 
And I've, um, over the years, I maybe um, feel like that's not, that's actually not enough because it still means that some people are able to, to opt in and participate and others may, may not show up because they, they actually don't have the resources to, to do this. They don't have the time or the money that is required. Um, and so I'm, I'm always interested in how people think about equity. It's a very good question. Also, the first three uh, you had. Um, let me quickly say that uh, on your diversity point, um, uh, we are discussing and developing the, the 42 uh, community guidelines for um, Wolfsburg and Heilbronn right now. And we're choosing radical inclusion really to um, uh, you know, put that idea of not judging where you come from, what you look like, um, as the first uh, principle there. And I agree, it's not only good um, in terms of creating uh, an environment where everybody can, um, can participate, but uh, as a model for um, how we should um, live together and work. And in that sense, you know, establish this um, university style or, or higher education style of learning that you do as a, um, as a runway for the rest of your life. So I hope you really, uh, the students really get out of that, um, seeing the, be the benefits of that diversity. Um, I could uh, um, comment on the other points as well, but let me um, speak a little bit about how I think about equity. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's really difficult, frankly, because uh, it boils down to the, the abstract point that, um, Yes, we would like to live in a fair world, but the world is not fair, right? So I think what we can do is um, we can uh, A, try to have very clear uh, and transparent rules and so that at least, you know, it's not that there is an um, explicitly unfair practice, but how to open up um, and to support those who um, usually don't have the uh, pathway to, to a school like that is, I think, a very good question. So one of the answers is, of course, uh, scholarships, right? In terms of um, affirmative action, um, we are looking into both. Um, so in terms of affirmative action, for example, we are, we are looking to do 50% of the participants for the boot camps for the piscines to be women, um, just to really um, drive that point home. I think um, that is the, uh, a fair way, um, rather than, you know, push, putting, we could have also put that limit on the accepted students. But I think that's actually going one step uh, uh, too far. But then again, it's, it's not a, a, an exact science. And then uh, in terms of scholarships, of course, the, then again, the question is who deserves the support most? And it's a, it's a very good question that we're um, discussing right now. What are the criteria for, um, for scholarship support? Um, for example, uh, you might have heard of the Ready School. Um, they're um, working with um, refugees in refugees, particular yeah. to to um, uh, train them and give them skills so they can find uh, meaningful work in, uh, in Germany and elsewhere. And uh, so they were excited about the 42 model and said, yeah, I mean, you know, what better could we um, uh, provide our um, our clients, our partners, and the refugees than uh, a good IT education. Now, um, you know, you could argue, but those are not the most needy, right? Those are people who are already somewhat qualified and shown some extra interest. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to um, uh, continue the conversation, and I think it's an ongoing uh, um, uh, struggle to, um, uh, you know, be at, uh, more open and to provide as much opportunity to as many people as possible. As um, you know, uh, opening up the educational resources is is one aspect that I think um, is very interesting. So that uh, you know, the the uh, means for learning and to develop the competence are accessible at least to as many as possible. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad actually that you started answering the question by saying it's really hard um, because um, 
it's something that uh, there are no easy answers. And and you're absolutely correct. Like it's a problem that is exists at a, in a at a systemic level at a level that's much higher than what you and I are trying to do. And so we have to exist within uh, a, a larger socio-economic structure that you know we have limited ability to change. Um, so. So I would just I'm just um, encouraging you to grapple with this more and um, we should we should definitely talk more about this um, separately. There are a lot of people at the Media Lab now and actually the Media Lab is not I probably shouldn't say this, but the Media Lab is not doing a fantastic job with respect to to equity itself in both our faculty hires and our student uh, diversity. Um, and, you know, we are grappling with this and it is it is hard. Um, but I'm uh, I'm optimistic that there there's a, a new group of people kind of that have come to the media lab recently, both faculty and students, who have put this issue more central to to the way we think about our own work. Um, in particular, there's a, a professor called Danielle Wood, who um, teaches a class on anti-racism and uh, technology design, and she she walks people through a process of essentially. Um, both the analysis of these systems that they're designing, but also then some ways to, to um, intervene in the design process uh, so that the outcomes are what, what she and Ibram Kendi called anti-racist. They argue that there's no such thing as not racist. You're either racist or you're anti-racist, which actually I struggled with a little bit initially because I felt, always felt like I'm not a racist. Um, but I wouldn't probably wouldn't have called myself an anti-racist because maybe just because my work is in a different area. But after reading some of the um, the uh, books and and uh, talking to Danielle, I, I understand kind of the logic behind it. And I think you know us working towards creating more fair and equal systems that is the work of anti-racism. Um, and so I'm, I think I'm more confident now, or I'm more comfortable now using that um, that term and aspiring to be an anti-racist. Of course, it's also, um, you know, we don't always get it right. We we do our best. Mm -hmm. Philip, as you said, and, and that um, uh, really makes me happy. We we need to continue this conversation. This is uh, the beginning of a journey. And uh, thank you so, so much for being on our side and sharing um, what you experience and, and what you see around us. I think, you know, having an open eye and, uh, and being um, open to, to learn and to find opportunities to uh, do things better is uh, part of the open exchange that um, makes us and the world better as a whole. It's part of uh, the, the human evolution. I really enjoy that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, let's continue it in a, um, another session very soon. Thank Thank you, Max, and best of success. And I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Very cool. Cheers.